Jesus today say amen. 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 It is by the grace of God that we have been rescued and we have a victory today. We're not only saved, He is sanctifying, moving us to become more like Christ today. I pray that's your prayer. I pray that if you know Him, you're walking with Him. I know that. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad everybody's here. I'm so glad I had a bunch of young guys help me out yesterday because I, they, don't, they look like they're walking around chipper and stride, man. I'm just all stiff and <laughs> sore, and I'm like, they must be younger than I am, because I don't know I can feel all that today. You know, I'm old. Uh, 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 if you haven't got a friendly reminder, there's uh, on the foyer, pick up one that's got some information on there. Um, and I just, uh, there's a few things that we have. Uh, on the 25th, we have a youth night, and um, that's from 6 to 8. Uh, that's a Friday night. And uh, I dropped it down to about 10-year-olds. So if any 10-year-old did not want to join, please come on out. We're going to have some games. We'll have a, a little uh, meal for them and a devotion. We'll, we'll, we'll have a great time. So uh, that'll be on June 25th. Also, uh, we're going to be starting up Sunday school uh, back up on June 27th at 10 a.m. So uh, just be praying towards that. Uh, it's, uh, we're excited about it. We're going to have... Uh, as, as time goes on, uh, we're, we're, Pastor and I have a, a kind of discussing how we're going to run it. So next week we'll probably announce some things about it and, and uh, get you excited about our Sunday school program that we're having. This is one of my favorite songs. So, um, you know, in, when I listen to the words of this song, it just tells me, and, and I praise God so much, that Jesus died on the cross for me. And he made a way for me to have eternal life with him. And this song, you know, if you listen to the words of it, it's kind of like saying to myself, when I come here to the altar, I need to die to self and then give it all to God. Help me to lay it down. Help me to lay it down. 
and for all once a more. You know, the writer of the song speaks about that struggle to lay it all down. We do have victory in Jesus and we can tell every person that we meet along the journey of life that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is rescuing the perishing. Those that are dying uh, can come to Him as we talked about last week. We have an appointment uh, with death. We also have an appointment for the judgment. And as we progress in that walk with God, we see those times coming. We understand the work that God's doing amongst us. Uh, God moved my heart this week to come back to the book of Titus. It's a little epistle. You'll find it over there towards the back side of your New Testament. Uh, there almost to the book of Revelation, just a few books back from there. Uh, you'll find the book of Titus. And, and there just before the book of Hebrews, you'll see the working of the epistle where God is working through the churches at Crete. Uh, particularly, it's a pastoral epistle. It's dealing uh, with uh, Titus and his ministry, his leadership, uh, the decisions that are being made uh, there amongst the churches on that little island of Crete and how these folks uh, that have now received Christ as their Savior are going to now build the work of God, the uh, church uh, that God has called them to. And here, as you look at this very courageous, very appointed book, uh, as we have the conviction to stand in a pagan culture. And folks, if you have not woke up yet this morning, listen to the preacher. We live in a very pagan, evil culture today. Uh, we are in these last days, and we need to understand that God's plan is not being accomplished. And we as a church family must work at accomplishing the plan of God, getting God's will done here on earth. We must be different than the culture that we're living in. And that's a struggle. Uh, that's going to look different. Uh, you know, when you talk to people about church and, and about dying to self, and, you know, that song that Miss Rhonda just sung, that is so culture contrary today. Uh, people's all about what's in it for me. Yeah. But friend, if you're going to live for Christ, <laughs> He must increase, I must yeah. decrease. Yeah. I must die to self. Self does not reign. And therefore, as it comes into the church, uh, we find here that God speaks to us about how to live after His way. Particularly here in the book of Titus. Titus was a young man coming along in his culture, uh, living uh, for God. He had worked in the church at Corinth uh, along with the ministries there. And now he went out with Paul and, and uh, moved on down through uh, the working of the churches uh, in the ministry of the missionaries. He came to the church at Crete, and Paul left him there, moved on, and now Titus had the responsibility. I want to call your attention to verse 5. Uh, we have studied the book of Titus uh, here as a church family, and so I'm going to take this morning and, and uh, just give you verse 5 and look at a few things here to understand what God expects of us as leaders, as followers in the family of God as the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, the, this is one of the strands that uh, incorporate all that God's doing in the church. Uh, it's not a single strand, but it's a three strand that he uses here. Uh, the first four verses deals with salvation. Friends, you can't be in Christ's church if you don't know Jesus Christ or your Savior. So, well, but I, I come to church and, and uh, I, I like Christians. I like the way that Christians live their life. And I believe in Christ. Friends, you've got to accept Christ as your Savior. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, you digest that. That's a whole lot. That's not a small statement. That is a statement that changes eternity. Salvation. But then he also deals with that second strand that's woven within that cable, that rope, 
that allows the church ministry to function and that's the leadership and, and the men that God puts into charge there and how that is going to work. And as those leaders believe, they give that third strand and that third strand being that is woven within that church family is for the Christians to live godly in Christ Jesus. To walk according to the Word of God by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the rest of the book. If you go on down through this little epistle, that's what he's trying to do. So he weaves that all together. And now you have the, the, the cable, the rope that, that pulls the load. That's how Christ works. You need to be saved. You need to have godly leadership. And you need to follow that godly leadership. There's a good simple recipe for you. All right, let's go home. <laughs> do that. We got it made. So what's that strain look like? That's where the preacher comes in. Verse 5. <laughs> Titus chapter number 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I have appoint, as I had appointed thee. And here you'll find the admonishment, the clear uh, teaching of the Apostle Paul, that in the church of Jesus Christ, now here's a newsflash for those of you that haven't picked up all that God's trying to teach us throughout the Word of God, that when you are working with human beings, when you're bringing people into walking in righteousness and following after God, when you're looking for godly leaders, when you're out evangelizing and uh, teaching and preaching and, and showing people the way to Jesus Christ, there are going to be some things that are wanting. Things that need to be done. Things that take forth in the church family that, that ministry to be fulfilled and to be doing the work that God's called us to. And, and so he says, Titus, you're there uh, to do the work that I've called you to do. To have that message of Jesus Christ. To appoint the leaders and then to teach the church, the, the followers of Christ, to do the work that God's called them to do. Now that strand is so woven in there that it's all part of the whole. It's a unified effort. It's not a single person. It's a unified effort. And that's what he's trying to teach here and, and to get across and, and to get our brains in gear to what God's doing. And, and it's so much different than this world. So here in verse 5, he sets out these church earthly leaders. What do they look like? A relative to the body and, and what does the body look like and how that they ought to operate therein and you know the the world has such strange views they you know they see the church as a social club a, a gathering uh, a place where you know folks come and and they have their friendships and they have their uh, ways and each church is a little different and they have their power struggles and all those things my friend that's not what God designed us to be God designed us to be the body of Jesus Christ. And it is not a matter that the pastor then becomes the dictator. Now, there are some dictator pastors around. Those of you that's been in churches, you've been into situations where you'll find that, you know, one guy runs the whole show and, and uh, it's either going to be his way or the highway. And most times it's the highway. And you've been around. The, if you're looking for that, I'm not your man. Brother Matthew's not your man. Because that's not who God called us to be. There's a lot of churches that are broken today because of bad leadership. There's also that philosophy that's going around the, the world today that you know the church runs like the American government. We're a democracy, a republic. Now, the American government was built off the Scriptures. And now the, the history books don't teach you that way, but if you go back past the revised history books, you get back into the truth. You look at the documents, and our forefathers built the design of the government and how the government was going to run and take care of everybody according to the scriptures. And friend, when we took God out of the government, the government has failed us and will continue to fail us. And the government's going away and they're, they're changing constantly. And if you're at all involved with that, and some of you just uh, coming up here uh, another month here, you'll have to deal with your taxes. If you haven't already, you're, you're going to run out of time again. And the IRS changes the rules every time you turn around. Why? Because the government is changing. 
Congress is constantly passing laws like that the government is changing. The, the court systems are passing laws in the judicial law and they're no longer considering the scriptures. They're no longer taking in the word of God. They're doing what is right in one man's eyes and they turn up the whole system and now the, the Congress has to go back and change the laws to uh, usurp authority over the judges and all these powers. And that. That's not the way the church is to be run. The, the church is not where the, the pastors, the CEO, and the, the advisement team, the deacons, they're the, they're the uh, Congress, as, as you would say, and the people are the voters, and they decide what's going to happen. Folks, that's not the design that God speaks of here. He says here, there in verse 5, that you're going to have these that are elect, those that are chosen, those that are appointed, those that are brought into this leadership. And that is God's prescribed system. That is where God says the church is that where the followers all come together and they bring together this teaching. They allow God to rule and to reign supreme and Christ to be the head of the church. It is to follow after that. And that's where the church comes from today. Here's where Titus is at there in Crete and the Apostle Paul as he's gone through his missionary journey and these early churches as they have flourished in these days. These are the models that they are after. They're looking for Jesus Christ to be the head of the body. It is a living organism, and that's what makes us so much different than any other. You know, the government wants to call us a nonprofit. We're not a nonprofit. We are the body of Jesus Christ. That makes us different than any other group. Uh, we're, we're not about the social aspect. And a lot of times we talk about that Wednesday night, and we, we've been praying about the spiritual aspects of the church and, and I encourage you, admonish you as your pastor, come to Wednesday night service at 7 o'clock. Learn to pray and, and have an encounter with God. Listen, God wants you to speak to Him. God wants to speak to you. And you need that encounter. You need that relationship with God. You need to build that. And, and we're working on that coming on Sunday school. We'll have different electives for you to learn the Word of God and to, and to see what the Word of God actually says and to, and to know the Word of God, that what God means by it. You see, the church is that where God is the head and then there's an under-shepherd and then there's followers that allows that church to function in all the different ministries. Now he uses the term here in verse 5, elders. And that is a term that is taught throughout the Scripture. You don't hear it a lot here in the 21st century. Uh, we use the word pastor, which is a synonymous word. It has a, a little bit of a different office of function to it. But there's also the word bishop and there's also the word leader there that God uses throughout the Scripture that teaches us these different offices that then function as one to become the whole of what God wants His church to be. And here in Titus chapter number 1, He's admonished to find these men and to appoint these men and to be the people of God that God's called us to be. In every city, so he says, set these things in order. Do the things that God has called you to do. Seek after righteousness. Seek after holiness. Become the people of God. And stand out as a lighthouse. Uh, be that watering well when people come in and they're dry and they're thirsty. And the, the darkness of the world has overcome them today. My friend, the church... Ought to, be their, ought to be their place of rescue, ought to be their place of, of, of finding God, finding the love of God, finding all that God's doing in their life. And that's what the church is to be about today. We're to live as that example. So he says, set it in order. Get there to that point. We don't live for ourselves. We don't come to church for what we can get out of it. Friend, we come to church to give what God's placed in our heart. To put that out, to minister to others, to help others to see what God's doing by giving testimony, by giving prayer, by seeing the things that God's doing in our life, we assure them of that. We support them by coming and sitting beside them and strengthening them 
uh, allowing them to ask the hard questions and find those hard answers in the scripture and find the biblical solution to the problem. Listen, this psychology and this humanism that's out there today that you got to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and you got to straighten yourself out and you got to do all the right things because you made bad decisions, now you need to make good decisions. That won't fix your soul. You know, well, if I get a good job, then I'll have everything I need. And if I just work and, and put a little money into the household, and then my household will be better. My friend, money will not fix your problems. Now, a lot of people don't believe that today in this culture. Yeah, a lot of people in the church, you know, it's it just run like uh, businesses are run today, and, and the businesses are the same way. It's all about numbers and noses, and, and if you've got the right amount of people and you've got the good offerings coming in, then you're a successful church. Now, my friend, you're a successful church when you're a spiritual church. When you're living for God, when the move of God is upon you, and there's only one way to explain what's going on in the house of God. God did it. It wasn't the pastor. It wasn't the song leader. It wasn't the choir. Well, I heard one day we had a choir. <laughs> been a while. They've been missing, but I heard there was one here one time. Yeah, but you got to remember about the old days then, you know. The good old days before COVID. <laughs> what a craziness that we have here. He said, well, that's what, no, listen, that didn't change anything that the church does. The church is still responsible to win the laws. The church is still responsible to build up righteousness and holiness. The church is still responsible to preach the Word of God. The church is still responsible to pray and to be following after the Lord's leadership, listening to the Lord, hearing that still small voice, doing the work that God's called us to do. So I want us to look here this morning, Titus chapter 1 and 5, and he speaks about that word elders where I'm headed for. You know, we need to understand from all of Scripture what that means. I'd like to show you a few Scriptures on that. First of all, that word elder there is that called leader. It's one that's been set apart by God and then appointed after by the congregation. Now, you can get into the qualifications on down here in Titus and 2 Timothy or 1 Timothy chapter number 2 there and you'll find that spiritual authority they have. But that word elder emphasizes the spiritual mature reflects that which God is doing in a man's life and by testimony of that is therefore to lead the church to show the way. You can find that throughout the Jerusalem church there uh, over there in the book of Acts and you'll see how that worked out in chapter 11, chapter 15, chapter 16 and how they appointed those men and how they were led to do the work of God. The church of Philippi is another good example there. In Philippians chapter number 1 and verse 1 we talked about a few weeks ago and you see the working of that elder, that leadership and you need that strong, mature leadership. Another word you'll see, not only an elder, but you'll see the word bishop or overseer. And it's the function of that office of the elder or the pastor or the leader and how they function as one. And that function is talked about in that aspect of the bishop. The Greek word there would be that uh, episkopos. It, it allows us to see that it's many facets. It's not just a simple term today. It's not just a matter to say that, that he's the preacher. There's a difference between pastoring and preaching and evangelism and missionary work. And so we call them by different names in the English language. In the Greek language, you had that same definition there. The word bishop, which would be synonymous with elder, was that, that in the function of that office. And I don't have time this morning to go to verse 5 here, verse 7 here in Titus 1. You can go back there to the book of Acts again in chapter 20, and you can find that function and how that it functions as an overseer of that office, of that superintendent, of seeing the work. And then you have the term pastor, and it's used throughout the Scripture, both in a noun form and in a verb form in the Greek language. And it, listen now, pay attention, we're going to get here in a minute. It's used with the word teacher over in the book of Ephesians chapter number 4. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter number 5, and you'll find this office and how that the church is different than the world. Listen, the problem we have in these last days, folks, the problem we're seeing is that we're not recognizing that the church is different than the world. 
It's not about coming and sitting for an hour and saying, well, I did my duty. I went to church this morning. It's about functioning in the body of Christ. It's about becoming the people that God's called us to be. It's about having all three of those strands woven together, unified, and moving forward in ministry. You find your place there in 1 Peter chapter number 5. We'll begin reading in verse 1 and listen to the admonishment here. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom I'm also an elder, a witness of the suffering of Christ, also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not of filthy lucre, but of ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being example to the flock. Now there's that term used in that noun form uh, that the pastor is therefore one functioning as that elder, the one that is leading the flock of God. He uses the word there to explain the authority that that pastor has, that leadership, that as they're woven together there, they're seeing that moving forward. And I'm telling you, what's killing the churches in America today is the lack of godly leaders. Being the pastor that God called them to be. Being an example to the flock. Not a one that does it, and I, I don't have time, and, and most of you are not uh, uh, probably uh, in that gift of being a pastor, and and, uh, and, men, and only men can be that. I'll, I, I can deal that with that later over in Timothy. <laughs> and God doesn't call women to usurp authority over men, and you can find that. I'll give you that someday, but right now you just stick it in your uh, crawl there and chew on a while and get back to it someday. <laughs> Some of you, may it may stick in you, and I'll have to, you know, but... Give me a call, text me, come by the office. We'd be glad to talk with you about it. That, that's a separate subject here. But he's talking about feeding the flock. And I want to come back to there. And he said to take oversight, but not by constraint. You know, listen, church, you've got to understand this, and we're missing this today. You know, nobody comes to church because you have to in America. You come to church because you choose to. Amen. You choose to. And the pastors to take those that choose to come and lead them in the ways of righteousness. We're to take those that choose to come to the church that are lost and undone, that have never met Christ as their Savior, and to evangelize them. That's that first thread. Remember, go back to uh, Titus chapter number 1 from verse 1 to verse 4 for those of you who in the study of Titus. It, it is that salvation by grace. Those that choose to come in. We go out and we beckon them to come. We, we call on them to come. But friend, they got to choose to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. We can pray for them, and you ought to pray for your family. And we got a, a list there, like I said, on Wednesday night, we're beginning there again of, of trying to bring forth that salvation. Folks, you ought to be concerned about them. You ought to be praying for them. You ought to be witnessing to them every time you get an opportunity. Now, you can't make them. I, I can't go over there and say, look, you're going to get saved today. You ain't doing that, Miss Barbara, tell you. She got saved at her living room beside her coffee table because she chose to. Was Brother Dooley one of them come by that night? Brother, Do Brother Dooley, I was sitting right back there. Went by that night event and witnessed to them. And Brother Ed and Miss Barb got saved in their home. That's evangelism. That's grace. God came by their way and saved their soul. But we have to be the one leading them. Look over in the book of Hebrews. He talks about that flock and, and how to follow after that and why we need to be concerned about that and why we need to be witnessing and why we need to follow God and leaders and why we need to walk in righteousness. And, and he speaks about it here in the book of Hebrews in the 13th chapter. And he gives us this admonishment to the Christians to understand this and, and to understand the the. the function of the pastor as a verb as a, in, in, in going forth and as a noun as a teacher to allow those things to happen in their life. Look with me in verse number 7. You found your way down there. Uh, Hebrews chapter number... Well, that is the wrong... Yeah, verse 17 is the one I want. I'm sorry. Verse 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have rule over you. Submit yourself, for they watch for your soul as they must give an account that they may do it with joy, not with grief, for that 
is not profitable, that for that is unprofitable for you. Here, he speaks about that authority, that that God's doing through godly leadership, and how that godly leadership, that elder, that bishop, that pastor, that leader that comes and brings forth that truth. He says, obey those things because they're bringing you the ways of righteousness. They're showing you the things that you must do. They're going to have to give an account, but friends, you also have to give an account. And it's unprofitable for you to deny the truth and to deny the working of God and to miss the work that God's doing. So what should that elder be that, that is spoken of there in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5? And, and what should he do? And what's that oversight? And that's a great analogy, a great example that we have there of a shepherd leading the sheep. That shepherd is one that takes them to the green pasture. That shepherd lays out the food and the nutrients and gives them out into the congregation. And that shepherd guides them and, and leads them under the ways of life and righteousness and, and rest and, and peace and joy in your soul under those green pastures. But folks, the sheep have to follow. Now that's against the way you are. Well, you ain't telling me what to do. <coughs> and there's a whole lot of people living their life that way today. There's people that put themselves in such a dark hole. Young man, 21 years old. You know, in the prime of his life that should have had everything to live for, but seen nothing to live for. Put themselves in such darkness and wouldn't listen to others. Wouldn't listen to family members. Wouldn't listen to godly counsel. Wouldn't take that there was a, a way to come around this thing, to see this thing. When you follow God and you do the right things and you become the people that God's called you to be, my friends, you'll find the ways of life. But you don't find it out there living on your own, doing your own thing, denying God and saying, it don't matter the way I live. I can live any way that I want to live and I can do whatever I want to do and there will never be no consequences. My friend, the Word of God does not teach you that. The Word of God teaches you that when you receive Christ as your Savior, that you're to follow, you're to die to self and lead after the ways of righteousness. You're to be that person that God's called you to be to reach to the third and the fourth generation to have that working of God to move from the children department to the couple department and to walk in the ways of righteousness to lead those ways to become leadership in the church and to see that. Folks, if this church does not get leaders, this church is going to die like many others are dying today. When there's not people out there willing to say, I'll do the work of the ministry. I'll walk up there and be the person that God shaped me to be and become that person that God's working in my life. I'll follow the things that God's doing in my life. I'll become the people that God's called me to be. Young men need to be mentored along, just as Titus was told, to go to every city and appoint elders to, to separate them, to sanctify them, to be the work of, of God, to call them to be the leader of the church, and then to allow them to lead, to shape their ministry, to become that person that God's called us to be. Every one of you have a shape of ministry. God didn't leave you here just to suck up air. God left you here to do something. And church, we got to do something. Say, so, well, we're hanging on to Jesus comes. Hey, listen, Jesus is coming. He told us to watch for Him, but He did not tell us to sit in silent. He told us to stay busy. He told us to, to go out and, and to tell those that do not know that Christ is coming. Share those spiritual gifts. Allow that to happen. Especially you young men. Listen, if you think God's calling you in your life, uh, Brother Matthew and myself, we'd be glad to help you. Glad to guide you. Glad to show you the way that God's working. If you're at that point where you see a ministry that needs done, God said, hey, these doors are open. Folks, church, we got to go through those doors. we got to do the ministry that God's called us to do. We just simply can't sit here. He said, go into every city. Go to every place and find the work that God's doing there and become the people of God. Allow God to direct the church. Allow God to appoint those leaders and then set them apart and do the work that God's called them to do. It's, it's a high calling of God. It is what God has placed within the body. It is the authority that Christ has given the church. My friend, the church is not alive and vibrant today because we're not letting Christ to be the head. 
And we're not following the leadership that God's placed there. We're not becoming righteous. You need to look at your life. Is your life progressing towards Christ? Are you walking different, talking different, living different? Are you concerned about the souls of the dying people around you? Are you praying? Are you in the Word of God? Is God doing something in your life? Amen. Say, well, I'm just hanging on till Jesus comes. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what God called us to do. He said, move up. Be somebody for God. Do something. Say, well, what if it don't work out? What if it does? What if God will use that and take that person and the grace of God come by and they'll kneel down at their coffee table and they'll ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior? What if they show up for church? Say, so, oh, they said they were coming last year at Easter and they didn't show up. <laughs> coming the 27th of June, they might just show up. You better be here because God could do something. Step out of that chair, walk down that aisle, and kneel at this altar and receive Christ as their Savior. To watch young men and young women grow and see a ministry. And whoa, to, you know, whether they stay here at the Friendship Baptist Church or they go to Africa or they go to Peru or they go to some other country and serve as a missionary. My friend, God can use people today. God's shaping and molding them. And that's the ministry of the church. We're not only to evangelize, we're to lead and we're to show the ways of righteousness. And all that's done every day in the ministry, in the working, in all that God's doing. The question is, are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you being the people of God? Are you concerned with others? Are you letting God lead your life? And when He tells you not to do something, you don't do it. And when God calls you to do something, you do it. You, you look for that miracle. You try to find those things that God's working. Over in Numbers 10, I don't have time this morning, but you go over to Numbers 10 there this week and you read, and you'll find that God moved the children of Israel and, and He was moving them towards the promised land and, and Moses and his father-in-law and, and all those folks were working at that. But He names all the different folks that He brought on each tribe. And each tribe He put a leader with. And each tribe had a responsibility. And they were headed for that promised land. And folks, if you'll trust God and follow God, God will do something in your life. God will not lead you into some evil demise. God will lead you to victory. Remember, the service, we started the service this morning this way. There's victory in Jesus. Amen. Victory in Jesus. Listen, Jesus Christ can save your soul. Jesus Christ can call you and give you a ministry. Jesus Christ is the one that can lead your life out of sin and into righteousness. You can do the right thing if you'll trust the Lord and follow Him. The question is, my friend, are you trusting God and following Him today? <coughs> are you letting God lead you? Do you have confidence in the Almighty God? Listen, you're going to fail, but God will lead you in the way of righteousness. Say, so, oh, preacher, my life is such a mess. You don't know all the things I'm doing. I don't have to know. But God can fix it. <clears throat> if you'll accept Him, if you'll trust Him, God will lead you into victory today. That's the way God's designed the church. Friend, this church is different. If this is your first time here, I, I know you're like, yeah, I, boy, I can see this thing. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Listen, I, I, for, let me quickly not close. I, I went to church. I was a, just a young man. I had all the things that the folks at church didn't want. I didn't fit at all. You talking about a sore thumb sticking out? I was one of them. My car and my motorcycles made more noise. I didn't like mufflers and I didn't like baffles. You don't look at the line scene, I'll explain them to you. <laughs> you didn't have to wonder if I was home. You heard me three miles away. The problem was I had to take the same thing to church. 
That first morning I went to church, I had open headers on a 65 Chevy Impella. You don't know what those are? Yeah. Every window in that church was rattling when I rolled in. <laughs> when I left that morning, I said, I'm not going back. Them people are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. I don't like them. They're not my kind. I'm headed for the racetrack. Three weeks later, <coughs> I downed that all. I asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. I still write a lot on Harley. <laughs> if you come by the church office any day but Sunday, it'll be sitting out here most days. This brother Matthew and I go, he don't like to ride with me. Sometimes you got to bring the car. And I got a muffler on my Honda now. That's the car, not the Harley. <laughs> but friend, that don't make me right with God. What makes me right with God is what God's done in my soul. Because I trusted what the Lord was doing in me. Won't you trust what God's doing in you today? Follow his leadership. The leadership of the Lord. God said, this is the way this thing's done. This is the way it's appointed. This is the working of God. Folks, the church is like nothing else you're involved with. Because there is the Holy Spirit of God that Jesus Christ left to move us and to direct us. Those that God's doing in our life and, and the things that we see. But Christian, listen, as Miss Rhonda sung, you've got to die to self and let God have control. As much as the sinner needs to trust Christ, you need to trust Christ. You need to follow Him. You know the right way. Let Him lead you to victory today. I know it's a different message this morning, but I want you to understand that in Christ you are accepted and you have a place in the body of Christ. This is 1 Corinthians. You can't read it up there. It's kind of small print, but I wanted you to see it out of 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 there and see that we're all part of the members of the body of Christ. I pray that you know that, that you walk in that. And friend, if you're a Christian today, I pray that you'll walk worthy of your calling. If you're not a Christian today, I pray you won't leave here without Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's a part that you can play in the body of Christ. You can be that which God's called you to be. I pray now that you'll do those things. Allow that to be your life. Friendship Baptist Church is here to help you. We're a lighthouse. We're a well of water where Jesus Christ is working. We're watching for God to do a miracle in this place.